let me start with you, Glenn. Yeah, yeah. you good? So one of the thoughts that has been uh, in my mind when I speak to, and in fact, conversations with academics and education leaders, particularly in the university setup is, look, we guys know what we are doing. We have, over centuries, perfected the art of how to train students in research and development. What is this open innovation system? Why are you, you know, sort of uh, bringing this idea when the universities have already served society through their uh, established practices? How do you respond to that? I think it's a very, very fair challenge. Uh, it's not the first time it's been made. And although I have colleagues back in the UK and colleagues in America and Canada and Australia in many other research intensive universities that try to isolate uh, themselves from the outside world, actually universities are changing and are listening. So in the UK, for example, uh, a lot of the measurements, a lot of the way we're measured, regulated, tested is actually a ground engagement. So one of the key metrics in a UK university that you're measured against is called the Research Excellence Framework. So it's a sort of seven year census of how important, how valuable your research has been. And partly it's about the quality of the research outputs. But the big innovation over the last few years has actually been around engagement. So at a British university, we've discovered looking at the uh, current set of metrics that actually been able to demonstrate in a single case study that you have had a positive impact on the outside world is worth 10 internationally leading articles. And this has fundamentally changed the way that universities have actually had to think about the way in which they engage. And there has been a, a, a I think, in nothing short of a revolution uh, in some of the leading UK universities, but also uh, internationally, about how we see ourselves and how we see our roles. Thank you, Glenn. Uh <clears throat> so what I understood is that I think universities are slowly but surely changing uh, and they're embracing the idea of uh, industry engagement. They are actually measured on it now. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's really a welcome sign. Um, which brings me to the, really the next topic, but uh, perhaps I can throw that at uh, Bryn. Um, that, you know, when we look at the curriculum and learning experience, uh, and we saw the fast forward movement, you know, big data, analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, robotics. Do you believe that uh, the university curriculum has actually lagged some of these innovations? That many of these inventions have come, I wouldn't want to use this phrase, but I would say that in spite of the university system, I think or have they come from the university system? Yeah, Has the curriculum lagged? I, th I think I d disagree with saying in spite, in spite of the university system, <laughs> probably. Um, it, it's true that some innovations have come from people that have dropped out of university, people that didn't finish their degrees, but, but universities, I think, are still an engine for innovation. They're an engine for uh, invention, uh, and I, I think they're playing a major role in, in driving technology and, and uh, science and engineering uh, forward. Um, I, I would actually, um, partly going back to the question that you asked, Lynn, I, I, would, I would admit that perhaps universities in the past had been uh, overly precious around IP, um, so, so that the perhaps um, uh, there had been some barriers to exploiting some of the ideas that had come out of, of university, and the move to open innovation, I think, is a very positive one and a real step forward in getting university ideas, university-generated ideas, out into the wider world. Thank you, Bryn. Very refreshing to hear. Uh, um, Professor Christopher, uh, a, a, a similar question, but industry engagement, and as a B-School, probably you're best qualified to answer this, that um, are universities doing lip service to uni industry engagement? For them, it means, yeah, I've got to place my students in a job let me have some part of their uh, learning experience as an internship or project be done in the university and hopefully you know they will pa find a pathway and you know my headache is over when they graduate uh, because you know some 
universities may think in some basic terms that this is university and, and, uh, and industry engagement. What would be a more sort of solid definition of, uni what are the specific ideas of university engagement with uh, industry? And Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the question. I think uh, very pertinent in the 21st century. Before I get on to answering that, let me also give you a, a socioeconomic context. I mean, there's this term that was coined by Dan Tapscott a few years back called Wikinomics. And Wikinomics is the economics of open collaboration across the world. Now, the best example of that is edX, a beautiful, unexpected collaboration between MIT and Harvard, who has sworn enemies for centuries. So the world is moving towards a collaborative model, and I think innovation should also follow suit. Taking from there, industry, university, industry, business school interface, I think is more now a priority than an option. The reason being, as you rightly said, the ultimate stakeholders is society at large. So the question that we need to ask ourselves, and I think it's a very important soul-searching question, are we preparing the relevant, appropriate graduates with the appropriate relevant skills ready for a future that is VUCA, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous? And the answer is very, very ambiguous because we're still grappling with it. But I think the way forward would be to look at strategic partnerships. Uh, the gentleman from uh, DTEC spoke about the Intel industry collaboration, the IBM Google collaboration. I think more and more of this should happen, not just from government entities. We really en encourage and appreciate that. But I think universities, business schools, we need to take it forward. I have one more thought which is part of our ecosystem, we have what is called an industry advisory board. And this board constitutes people who are uh, you know, C-suite executives who are driving the industry. So it could be a supply chain a gentleman from a DHL, maybe a person from an IT major, uh, Microsoft. These are actual real people. A couple of people from Author D. Little, from McKinsey, uh, Boone, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Boone uh, and Company. So the idea is that you create a set of professionals who can provide strategic inputs to the academia. So it goes beyond internship, beyond projects, and beyond placements. Well said, thank you. I think uh, what I really sort of stuck my head was uh, that it has to be a more sort of 360 degree view of what we can do with industry, ranging from advice to uh, real projects which are jointly owned, co-owned uh, as well. and. Uh, I like the whole idea that you know we have to prepare the students, and I think we don't have an answer ready for an ambiguous and a sort of volatile future. And I think that is really an educational challenge, which I'm sure all of you sort of uh, agree with. So uh, over to uh, Raj, as you know, one of the uh, oldest uh, campuses here. Uh, you are a locally accredited uh, university. Uh, you have to measure up to the uh, UAE Vision 2021. Um, are uh, universities like AUD and others who have to serve a sort of uh, national agenda really partnering with university educational services companies, accelerators, angel firms to really encourage students to towards entrepreneurship and charting their own journey? Are universities like AUD engaging other stakeholders? We spoke about industry, but you know there are others as well. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for everyone uh, who helped put this together. I know it's uh, not easy to do this, so there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, and uh, uh, I really appreciate that, and thank you for having me here. Um, that was a long question. <laughs> um, you know, I just... Before I answer that, just, just a couple of things. Um, you know, you began with uh, universities and research and, and what have you. Uh, those of you that know AUD or have known AUD for a while, you know, we've got a unique uh, challenge. Um, we started 23 years ago in, in the UAE as a teaching-focused university. Um, so, you know, when we hired anyone, including Khalid in the crowd there, <laughs> um, it, it was much about how good are you in the classroom, and it was very little about research. Uh, a lot has changed in 23 years. Um, since then, we've acquired AACSB accreditation. Now we're going through a challenge of how do you get people to teach 
but then also produce research. You know, and uh, that's an interesting case study, and we're almost going the opposite of what everyone here is facing. Um, you know, and now that brings on serious challenges as well. So uh, yes, now we're getting big time into research because of AACSB, uh, but then having coming from a background that is teaching focused, uh, you know, you've got the perennial problem of how can I do research when I've got X number of teaching loads, and I'm just being very candid here. So, you know, now we've got to address the issue of research is really important, but we also now need to look at teaching loads and see how we reduce that so there's a, you know, um, a win-win or uh, some kind of um, balance. Um, now, engaging industry, innovation, entrepreneurship, all these things, uh, you know, they're, they're very difficult. As you rightly mentioned, AUD is, is accredited. We're accredited by the Ministry of Higher Education in the UAE. Uh, we're also accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools in the, in the USA. Um, you've also mentioned that this, this kind of um, uh, ecosystem requires a lot of collaboration. It requires collaboration between governments, between uh, different stakeholders like investors, um, small businesses, uh, students, customers, etc., etc. Now, when you're accredited by the Ministry of Education, um, there's certain things you must do. So there's certain things that are imposed on you. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, we're told to do something. Um, then we have to think, how does that fit into our system? And then how can we balance all this thing with innovation and entrepreneurship and so on? Um, you know, just in, I, I know in the university, not in the business school, but we've actually lost a program because it lost its uh, appeal to students because something was being imposed on us to include in the program. So, you know, it, it, is, it is a heck of a challenge, uh, but the way forward, as was rightly pointed out, is that you cannot work in isolation. We need to work with each other. We need to realize what's the value proposition, and then we need to work together between government, industry, academics, and so on to all work towards that value proposition. Uh, so you can't have things imposed that then go against what you're trying to do, which is serve the students in terms of innovation and succeeding out there. Um, you know, I've, I've mentioned a lot of challenges. Let me say a couple of brilliant things. You know, when you work for an American university, you're then, certain things are instilled in you. Uh, you know, things like critical thinking. We don't come from a curriculum that is rote memory. Um, so, you know, when you come to AUD and you leave AUD, you, you leave as better thinkers. You leave as you know, people that can solve cases, that can offer solutions, that can analyze things, that can communicate, that can speak in public, and so many other things. That's your question. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I did see that there are challenges. Uh, there are regulatory challenges. There are certain constraints on how much of the curriculum can you really adapt or are allowed to adapt. Uh, I think. Uh, Teaching capacity versus research load is a real challenge. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what I saw uh, as a strand in all the four panelists who spoke so far was, I think, preparing students through real skills like critical thinking, judgment, um, communication and presentation, um, and becoming sort of ready for an ambiguous uh, sort of volatile future is a strand that I feel uh, all of you echoed that it's, it's important. Which brings me to uh, uh, Mr. Kothari that uh, school system obviously is a feeder into the university system. So my question to you is that are we in our school system, which is probably even more oppressive in terms of restrictions compared to uh, the university system, are we encouraging students to be curious, creative, bold, and passionate? Uh, happy morning to all of you, uh, because the year of happiness. Uh, I feel uh, quite uh, safe because everybody who is on my right side are in the higher education, so I can afford to make mistakes, because I'm sure as I go up the ladder, I'll be corrected. Uh, Ajay, as you said correctly, I mean, there are always challenges in the school system. Uh, over a period of time, the 20 years that I have been associated in secondary education, K-12, 
Last three or four years, there is a dramatic change that we are going through. As we say to parents that we don't teach anymore in the classroom. What's really happening in the classroom is learning. And learning comes from thinking. So there is no more teacher coming in the classroom, giving a lecture, looking at the textbook and goes home. Now it's other way around. It starts, the classroom starts with the first question from a student. That means they're thinking. We have obviously in the lower end of the education system being the school, there's a difference that we make between innovation and invention. Obviously our inventions are limited. So what we do, we take advantage of inventions done at the higher education end and implement and integrate them with our education system. For example, in our school, we have introduced in the last three years STEM labs. STEM lab, basically what we are doing, we are mapping our curriculum of science, English, maths, and technology as part of their curriculum and using this as a tool, a innovative tool to ensure they understand what they're doing. It has become more application-oriented learning, which was not the case earlier. It was rota learning earlier, particularly in the Indian education system. There's no more rota learning. Now it's more of thinking. It's more of participation, more of application. And that comes from innovation. We started another project recently called Seat to Plate. All we did, young kids, we gave them small pots where they could plant seeds, grow fruits, and take it to the plate. Now, this is nothing but teaching them or so that they learn what the biology is all about. How does plant come to life and so on and so forth. So these are innovative. I mean, we have various uh, methods like flip uh, class system. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we did recently, as you may have known, many people who live in UAE would know, we joined hands with one of the NGOs, uh, Gurdwara, where we uh, s distributed 2,000 saplings of plants to students. And then we, as a school, we gave 700 saplings to another school, collaborative method of learning. Now, these are nothing but making children aware through these small experiments, small steps, what it can do big in years to come. So yes, there are challenges that we have uh, because we are governed by uh, Ministry of Education or KHDA. When we have to implement any of these projects, they cost money. Uh, we are not able to charge. So therefore, our ability to introduce more and more ideas which may result in cost, we are not able to uh, charge to the parents. Therefore, we are not able to bring to the classroom. We like to do it. We have done some representations both to KHD and government, and we have found great support. They have said to us, okay, why don't you come in the beginning of the year and tell us what you want to do, and we'll give you permission. So like we got certain approvals from them. There is resistance from parents, because they think if you're within the school hours, you're teaching them something, why would you charge them more? Now, obviously, when you buy these resources, when you invest in these resources, uh, I won't look at it from ROI point of view, but there's a cost that we incur. Somebody needs to share the cost. We as a school are willing to subsidize. We as a school are willing to share the cost, but obviously we are not in the position to absorb 100%. These are small challenges. We have found over a period of time when parents can see the benefit of these things that we are doing, they are willing to share the cost with us, and we have uh, been able to introduce that, and I'm Pleased to say that like uh, year before last, out of 22 students who got Hamdan Award, 16 were from our school. So obviously they have done very well. Uh, and that is because there's emphasis on uh, innovation, use of technology. We are very, uh, very uh, tech savvy. And I can say that every single student in the school, uh, every single teacher in the school has to be technology savvy. And these are innovative things like smart boards is now no more uh, Technology now it's a must in the classroom. So we, uh, only thing we do is we don't let teachers bring a pre-prepared lesson. They have to make the lesson plan. Therefore, they have to think. Even the teachers have to think. They just can't pick up uh, plug and play lessons. So things like that. And I'm pleased to say that uh, kids today are very very keen. They are more innovative. They are better thinkers than they were of my time. I can say that for sure. Thank you. Well, looks like uh, you have a bright young future uh, under your stewardship in your school. And what I gathered was, I think, uh, application is important. 
the great example of seed to plate and uh, sh you know saplings was i think will change something inside uh, their minds that uh, you know uh, how growth happens and uh, not just about learning bio biology plus they become environment uh, yeah, environment uh, friendly. Uh, uh, friendly and aware and tech savviness has to run through the institution it must include teachers who need to be tech savvy students uh, obviously are uh, so thank you for your comments um, back to uh, uh, glenn uh, should uh, the university curriculum have mandatory uh, elements although i don't like that word mandatory elements that build innovation competencies uh, all the way through their educational cycle universities may believe that they already do so uh, but a more systematic way of building innovation competencies not just the usual uh, buzzwords sorry to say you know critical thinking communication and presentation teamwork leadership but real competencies that entrepreneurs and innovators need uh, so i think my simple answer to that would be no and the reason is that actually in a big comprehensive university there are a great many subjects we're actually uh, parachuting in two or three modules on innovation, entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship, would seem quite alien, uh, would jar with the students. They wouldn't thank you for that. Their ambition is not necessarily to go and work in industry. They have other ambitions, and actually, you need to be fairly sensitive and sensible about where you, where you introduce it. What I would say is that there are certain categories of subjects so around the natural sciences, engineering, we're absolutely, and uh, good universities have it built into their curriculum now, uh, businesses, economics, finance, we're absolutely, again, you would expect that kind of thing uh, to be an important part of, of what you teach. But I would also say, and I think the point has really been one way or another touched on a num number of occasions, that it's not just about technology and innovation. One of the buzzwords of the moment is entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship kind of assumes that actually while some people are built uh, with an appetite for risk uh, to go out and uh, change the world, most people aren't in built in quite the same way. That actually they're going to work in a big organisation one way or another. But actually what you want to do is replicate within that an environment an appetite to make a contribution. And the contribution is not just about technology. One of the things that I find distressing about conversations around technology and innovation is the uh, Google and Apple and IBM, they're the exemplars that come up time and time again. But actually, innovation is found right across the innovation. In some ways, most of the innovation that takes place is comparatively mundane. But it nonetheless has a profound impact on the operations and sometimes the strategy of those organisations. So part of what we've got to do is actually to get people who are doing those subjects or who are looking to do those subjects to operate entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurially, to have a sense of actually what innovation is, where it's appropriate, discriminating alignment, but not just develop IQ, develop the emotional intelligence, de uh, develop the skills that you need, not just to come up with good ideas, but actually to sell those ideas within the organisation. I've sat in many, many meetings in my time, and as, a, uh, as an uh, academic administrator and academic leader increasingly, uh, I, I've sat in many, many meetings, and good ideas just get passed over, and they get passed over because the people don't know how to sell them. So actually, a lot of the skills that we want to focus on are not just having the good ideas, it's actually how to uh, articulate them in a way that authentically connects with the priorities and the agendas of the institutions they're working in. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's a bit of a follow-up question, uh, uh, picking up from Glenn, that uh, uh, we speak about, you know, there are certain disciplines like business, economics, uh, engineering, technology that are more sort of market-oriented, uh, and that's where we need to instill the uh, uh, the innovation mindset or entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial sort of components in the learning experience. Um, but the same universities say, you know, regardless of the discipline that you have, I want a certain college readiness. I want great writing skills. I want great critical thinking skills. I want this person to know how to be a team player and, uh, 
uh, and um, you know those those core competencies of the learning experience those i'm sure every one of you will agree must be present in any college why regardless of discipline even if you are a history or a uh, you know sociology student why can't being innovative and entrepreneurial be a core component of the skills uh, that, that you must learn to be in college yeah, yeah. why should it be restricted to just business technology and those disciplines yeah. why are we sort of making innovation uh, innovative thinking a pariah just just these guys let's these guys do it we'll we'll reserve some disciplines the soft disciplines with us yeah i I'm, in some ways I, I i disagree a tiny bit with with what Glenn said I, i'll start off though as as many of you might appreciate one of the best ways to get a university not to do something is to tell academics that something's mandatory because that, 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 that is that's that's death to death to some some things um uh i so so saying that um training and innovation or enterprise is, is mandatory it's compulsory it should be in every course every every module um, it, it's something that would get a lot of pushback. But nevertheless, I actually think there's a lot of merit in that. Um, in my own um, past life as uh, Dean of Postgraduate Studies in Science and Engineering, I employed, I recruited and employed an enterprise lecturer to work for me, and we made available courses in enterprise and entrepreneurship at every level. So whether you were an undergraduate or a postgraduate, a PhD student or a master's student, you wanted a 10 credit course or a 20 credit course, you wanted it in different teaching formats, it was available within the menu and it could be slotted into any program. So I, I think it is important. I think it's important for scientists and engineers. Equally, I think it's important for fashion. We teach fashion at Harriet Watt in Dubai. It's important for fashion designers. They often work for themselves. Fine artists, musicians, lots of people with non-science and engineering skills need uh, skills in the area of creativity, enterprise, entrepreneurship to help them in their um, future careers. What, where, where I agree with, with Glyn, I'm not a big fan at least with my background in the science and engineering, of simply parachuting courses in or things in. I don't, I don't want people to come to work and say, you know, uh, Sunday to Thursday you were doing mechanical engineering, um, but on Friday morning we're going to do a session for you on enterprise, and this is something different, and it's not related to anything that you, you do. My own preference in teaching creativity, enterprise, entrepreneurship, is to embed it throughout the programme. And you can do that in things like coursework, um, exercises, group work. Increasingly at Heriot Watt, we're looking at global working with students working on projects across campus. And you can build in entrepreneurship and in entrepreneurial skills um, in that area as well. But there is still an opportunity. I think the challenge type competitions have value. And I did a small amount of research on this in a, in a previous life where um, I, I know in Dubai, this might be, it might be difficult to believe, but in the UK, some students don't like the word entrepreneur. They see it as having quite negative co connotations. I had a very angry PhD student write to me once to complain about why I was making him study entrepreneurship, and he told me he hadn't studied ecology for 10 years to become an entrepreneur. And for him, it, 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 it's generating quite a violent response. So sometimes I think you've got to be quite subtle how yeah. you teach these skills. I think you can yeah. embed them in. So for me, things around social challenges, environmental challenges, um, asking um, students to find a creative solution to a problem, I think fires them up. And you can teach them creativity, entrepreneurship skills, um, but it's kind of hidden. And it gets you access to that difficult to get to um, market. And that I was also going to make the point that Glyn did make, actually, that um, and I, again, I hope this, well, maybe I'm hoping it is controversial or not controversial, but I think it's unrealistic to think that every student we're going to turn out is going to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I don't think it's at all unrealistic to ensure that every student we turn out is an intrapreneur, and those people are just essential to the economy, that if you don't have employees who can be creative, who can identify opportunities and have got the energy and the abilities to pursue them, then the economy is going to fall apart. So those people are essential as well. And it's our duty to deliver people with those skills. Thank you, Bryn. This was brilliant. I think uh, the, 
as a father of a millennial, I know that if you impose and give a label to something, uh, there is an immediate re reaction not to accept it. But more as an educator, I also uh, believe that I think embedding uh, uh, innovative thinking, uh, being able to uh, passionately believe in something, pursue the idea, sell it, and advance that, should be embedded into everything that we do in the university. Uh, it shouldn't be parachuted as you know one course. Uh, so this was brilliant. Thank you. Um, which brings me to uh, 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 Professor Christopher, and this is really your uh, favorite theme. You think a lot about uh, positive psychology. You think a lot about happiness, uh, and you've done a lot of research on this. Um, so what is the connection between uh, 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 you know, a, a, a creative society and a happy society? Uh, does innovation play a role in all this? Okay. Uh, let me give you a very recent example that happened as uh, late as two days back. This was at the Strategy Execution and Innovation Forum, a C-suit event where you had senior level 40, 50 years old. And uh, I had uh, a session at the end of day one which was a 90-minute session. The session was designing innovative strategies using happiness by Lego blocks. I mean, real Lego blocks. We had an audience of about 80 plus, all, most of them gray-haired like me, and you could see the child and every single one of them come from five minutes onwards. Initially, it took some time for them to really believe they're gonna play with Lego blocks. Now, the biggest lesson for all of us sitting here is that in our conventional educational system, we have done some Himalayan blunders, <laughs> if I may use that word. I mean, if you go back in time, the educational system that we have inherited is from the Industrial Revolution. It made a lot of sense then to have that study. And let's be honest, brutally honest here, in the current system, knowledge which is available at the touch of a button need not be imparted by the educational system. In other words, we facilitate that and make that available to the student. Raj was talking about critical thinking, which is part of the uh, you know, ethos of the educational system. Let's go back. You know, Here's a startling statistic that children start asking questions when they start talking. And the question starts increasing every year. And this is between two years to five or six years. After six years, something remarkable happens, scary thing happens, that they stop asking questions, right? And I think parents, the school system, the educational system, with exceptions like DPS, we have killed the power to ask questions. So one of the things, and we say shut up, because we ask the questions, you answer. And I think that is completely wrong. So we need to create the power to ask questions. He said, we start the class with questions, number one. Number two, we have effectively killed curiosity, the power to seek, search. And I think 21st century, there's something called search intelligence. One of the key critical skills for the 21st century is how do you search? Yeah. Where do you search? What do you search? And how do you find the answers? Because they're all there. Yeah. So I think we need to reframe our paradigms in terms of what we impart. Now let me get into a personal example that we do at SP Jane. We have created these labs. We're speaking about artificial intelligence, virtual reality, IoT, uh, big data. Now, you might wonder, what has all this got to do with a business school? We so if you look at a typical university system, or even a business school system, the supply chain professor has his own kingdom, the marketing professor has his own kingdom. I think we need to move from that to cross-functionality. So even if one course can be taught by three professors, cross-functional teaching, cross-functional case studies, cross-functional research, and the other most important thing is that we have uh, you know, created this demarcation. Creative people and non-creative yeah. people. There's nothing, it's a big myth that we bring that. It's a whole brain system. The good news is that all of us can be trained to be creative, can be trained to be innovative. We have got this mindset, you know, it's a mindset thing, this entrepreneurship that he speaks about, or that I'm not an entrepreneur. No, it doesn't matter. You need to be just creative, you need to be innovative. The good news, and this is where I think regulators also can be open. Many of you know we are an Australian accredited business school, Texa. It took some time to convince them, but here's the good news, that in our undergraduate and master's programs, we actually have credit courses on design thinking, on creativity and innovation, on 
uh, emotional intelligence. It's a one credit course, right? So what we've tried to do is we have put it under the label called employability and practitioner skills. And once you do that, the regulator understands, yes, they are preparing them for employment, they're preparing them for practical, uh, relevant life skills. And I think it is very much possible. So long answer, but I thought I should share my two minutes on no, this. This is, this is great. Thank you, uh, Professor Chris. Uh, the Himalayan blunder, uh, I think, has to be, uh, is hard to demolish, but we are getting there uh, through uh, efforts like yours. And I think uh, reframing the whole uh, learning experience, uh, you gave some excellent examples of even creating labs in a B school for some of these emerging technologies. That's really innovative. And I think uh, uh, the other aspect is uh, under the so-called uh, within courts uh, academic independence, there are silos that have been created within universities. It's time to demolish uh, that, some of those ideas. Um, and uh, I think creative versus non-creative is a misnomer. Uh, everybody is a whole brain person, and we need to kindle the right uh, uh, buttons uh, to, to get the best uh, innovations out. So thank you for your comments. Um, Suraj, uh, talking about uh, AUD uh, specifically, uh, you know, ev all institutions look up to AUD. That look, it's thank one you. of the oldest. Uh, it has to, uh, you know, sort of uh, be set an example for other institutions. Um, uh, what uh, do you think uh, would be, you know, your dream for AUD to uh, contribute to the UAE Vision 2021? Um, what could you do as an institution, particularly in the area of innovation? If you had to write the strategic plan, it's an unfair question. I think Lance Timasi should be answering yes. this, yeah. but we'll give you a shot. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that, and thank you for putting me on the spot on that one. But if I can just backtrack on a couple of things that happened before. Um, you know, uh, I teach HR as well, and one of the things I do is stay um, current in the news. And uh, just last week, there was an article published that said, you know, the hardest things managers find in, from their employees is implementing strategies. So it's just not in, in academia. You know, it's, it's, it's actually quite through the world. We're brilliant talkers. We're brilliant at, you know, saying we're going to do certain things, but the hardest thing is closing the loop and, and you know, actually, actually doing it. Um, yeah. And this in this ecosystem that we mentioned earlier, the, the partnership is so important, like, you know, the how and the why and, and so on. Um, just something else that happened earlier as well is that, you know, the beauty at AUD, one of the things that you, you have there is you've got 130 nationalities in our student body. Uh, you also have courses that go from design to business to engineering. You also have courses that have a mix of all these students. So if you like, we don't have to put uh, innovation in every yeah. course. It happens. It's just embedded. When you've got a design student working with an engineering student, with a business student in one class, and one's from Pakistan, and one's from Japan, and one's from Korea, and one's from Australia, and so on, you know, imagine that, that when that happens, it, it just, you know, it just happens, it, you know, the, the creativity, the diversity of thought and, and, and what have you. So in that way, we're blessed in, in so many ways that we don't have to sort of think of innovation courses, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but we, what we do do actually is, is we have an innovation week in, in every one of our classes. So the, the professor must do something that's very current and, and sort of innovative, wherever it's applicable, of course. Um, now, I think one of the things of, of being the oldest university, or one of the oldest, in, and certainly the oldest American university in, um, in the UAE, um, is, is, is you have to be in line with the strategic plan. So um, my dream would be to have all the stakeholders uh, work towards this value proposition that I mentioned earlier. Um, if we are going to be brilliant contributors to uh, Dubai 2021 and the vision and what have you, we need the government, the ministry, um, yes, to, to definitely give us guidelines, benchmarks and what have you, because that's, that's what your, um, you know, there's your rule of thumb and what it defines quality. But at the same time, you know, we, we need to close the loop. So if we're saying, you, you know, universities need to produce X amount of research, uh, then I think it's, it should be incumbent to trust the university to know what they're doing um, and then, you know, bring out their own curriculum and, and, you know, make them responsible and accountable that way. 
uh, something that I know my academics would like me to uh, or like to have is if you're going to impose uh, amounts of research, then also impose the teaching load. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, so if you're going to have a certain amount of research, then also to to really facilitate that, let's 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 have that. Um, we we the other thing, uh, you know, we we need to build and continue to build stronger ties with industry, uh, not just lip service as you mentioned earlier, uh, but you know, bring bring industry into our classrooms, have internships, have real life uh, projects. You know, where LG come in and say this is a challenge we're facing. Um, you know, have students in there and say, look, this is the challenge. What are you going to do about it? Get together and and you know, give us a solution um, and 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 what have you. I don't think I fully answered your question, but I'm not in that position to do so. But uh, no, but I, we did uh, certainly appreciate that you you acknowledge your role as a leading light university to be a part of the UAE vision, and also um, I think some of the things that you do, like Innovation Week, uh, and the fact that I think execution skills and implementation strategies are something that uh, are a missing piece uh, that you see when you talk to industry and you're trying to sort of inculcate that in your uh, uh, educational practices. This is great. Uh, so this is really the last question before we move on to five second sound bites. Uh, so uh, Mr. Kothari, <laughs> uh, is, uh, this may not be connected to the theme of the discussion, but this is something that has struck me for a while. Is it a culture or a sort of a big shock for school students to enter university from a highly protected, controlled environment to <clears throat> an entirely different system where you have to be self-guided learners, uh, you have to take autonomy and charge for your decisions, and there is no sort of uh, support system available for you. So. What, how do you see that transition and do you do something to prepare them? Exactly. Uh, a very, very important question. And in fact, uh, we recognize this problem uh, from grade 9th onwards. We know that after grade 12th, well, they'll go to different universities, maybe different countries, completely different work environment, social environment, and so on and so forth. Therefore, there's a lot of counseling that is being done. We prepare these students as to what is coming, and that is not only by giving them workshops, but we have the people from various universities come and visit our school, talk to them, tell them what they can expect. Therefore, we in the school can help. And I think most of the good schools are doing that. We are not the only exception. I think all good schools prepare their students right from grade 9th, 10th onwards not only for academic preparation, but also the transition that they will have from uh, quote unquote protected. In fact, today nobody is protected. The child, you know, parents have a myth, the children listen to them. And it's nice to live under that myth, but they do exactly what they think. They are good thinkers. Uh, this generation is wonderful generation because they're very honest. Uh, they speak their mind out, uh, number one. They know the difference between Majority of them know the difference between what they should not be doing versus what they should be doing. It's not wise only to know what to do. The wisdom is in knowing what not to do. And I think that's where we as a school in our uh, various lessons, in various uh, interactions with the students, prepare them as to what they should not be doing. And uh, obviously this adolescence transition from school to university is a huge challenge because all of a sudden they land up at a place, uh, whether it's India or it's elsewhere, which is quite different to a great extent than what they've gone through. Therefore, while it's a challenge, but we, and when we recognize the challenge, then we prepare them for it. We have found, because we ask the students to come back, a lot of them come back to the school to share their experiences. They come and talk to the students of grade 11th and 12th and tell them what they benefited and what they missed out. So that helps us in preparing. So we have this regular interaction of our uh, alumni. The students come back and talk to the students. So that's how we prepare them. You know, you, you can't 100% prepare them. There is, I think in every transition, there is a, um, uh, there's an element of challenge. And as long as we know what the challenges are, 
as long as we can address them, then we can prepare for them. And that's what uh, I think all good schools do. They invite their old students, they come and share their experiences. They also share with them what are the opportunities available to them elsewhere. Not only challenges, but also opportunities available, which helps them in thinking as to which career path they should choose choices. So uh, it's very important that uh, schools must have regular interaction with the old students, with the batches going out, because that's how they, they can, it's a sharing of information, transfer of knowledge. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kutari. I think we've had a very rich discussion. And I think uh, there is patience level is wearing out. There is tea after this. So 10 seconds sound bite, starting with Glyn. If you had one recommendation on how industry and academia can connect together, what would it be? The same question to all of you. I think the first thing is that academia and industry have to make efforts to understand each other. So it's not just a question of uh, making universities the servants of, uh, of industry or making industry take the crumbs of the academic table. Actually, it has to be an authentic dialogue and actually if you can get that dialogue working, productive relationships, both on a research side and teaching side, just aren't possible, but there's some of the most exciting work that universities do. Thanks. I think uh, for me, I think there's a lot of value in getting uh, business uh, into the classroom and really showing students that having a good idea or an invention or thinking of a concept isn't enough. You've got to do something about it to have an impact on the world. Narratives, stories, strategic conversations, role models, and platforms like this on a regular basis that disseminate the relevance of industry academia partnership. It's imperative. And I think that's the way forward. How do I follow that? The easiest thing to say is all of that. And, uh, you know, having, I want to say something a bit radical, a bit different. Um, my younger son is autistic. I would love to see more done by industry. We, we, we're all, we, we, we've got things for gifted. We've got things for the high achievers and everything else. Let's do more with special needs. Let's, you know, when you get to 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, the system lets you down and people with special needs fall off the cliff. Let's teach them skills. Let's get them in the workplace. Let them give them value to life. And my, my son was lucky enough to do that, uh, but I'd love to see others do it. You know, from uh, school education to industry perspective, the most important is a lot of students who don't do well in grade 12, and therefore they don't get to into good universities. I think industry can play an important role by creating these students' um, uh, institutions which can make them employable, Therefore, dropouts of grade 12 should not feel left out, and they should not feel that they are not good for the society. So I think industry can play a very dominant role by absorbing dropouts of grade 12. Safety network. Safety network. Yeah, that, that's where uh, we'll create a lot of social uh, peace by doing that. Otherwise, these kids just go nowhere in life, and they become a social uh, disturbance, so to say. Yes, open to questions now, Khalifa. <laughs> Uh, guys, honestly, like uh, the amount of knowledge and discussion you guys had, like I need to reflect for a few days on them. I mean, they were amazing. I am so happy to be here today. I thought I'll done, I'll do my part and leave, but I couldn't. Uh, I just want to bring few points uh, and alarms that I'm glad you guys are here. You can react somewhere. I can't change those things, and I wish there's someone from the ministry here, so they can hear it. But I'm glad they're not. You guys can put it there. I think uh, some of the systems in universities today that they judge you after four or five years of reporting systems and whatever. The problem with that, if you look, more than 90% of data collected on Earth happened over the last two years compared to the other 10% from ancient Egyptian time up to now. If, you're, if your judgment or proof of that you're doing well or not is a six or seven years uh, progress check, we will be falling behind like nothing. And honestly, and I even hear you guys when you're talking about the ministries and their approvals and their, they're trying to kind of put you on track, but they don't know the track anymore because the track is way not what they are doing. So God bless you on all of that, but you need to be really 
worried about the fact that no one knows where are we going and we should find something very important that uh, every systems are missing is we need to find the passions of those people. I won't say student or kids. You need to find the passion because everyone, if you teach me to become the best engineer or in whatever field, I am not going to live the next 30 years in something because my dad wanted that. You need to find passion. And I am a big innovator, entrepreneurship, like advocate, but that doesn't mean it's the best for everyone. I want to be a singer. I want to be a daydreamer. I want to be whatever. Find passion in people and put them in that system. That way they'll strive. That's what we are missing. Schools today are putting us in five categories, like science, uh, uh, people in uh, like non-art, and so on. But maybe there are other things. That's the problem. So please, guys, you are the future for us because you are. Make sure your plans and judgment doesn't take three, four years to make a plan change when things are really happening much faster. Thank you, Khalifa. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions here? Yeah? You got a mic. Thank you very much. Really, it's very enlightening. I mean, we've been talking about uh, innovation in education system. Uh, do you agree that uh, the 18 years journey for an individual? It's very lengthy now uh, due in this exponential growth that's happening around us. You know, we start through from KG until university. That's a very hectic journey for all of us, really. Is there any kind of innovation can be done to really reduce that time? That's a brilliant uh, sort of pointed <laughs> question. I don't even know who to direct it to. Let me start with Professor Christopher. Uh, amazing question, first of all. And I think, again, this is where the narratives and the conversations need to change. We have been stuck in an industrial revolution system, and we need to start talking. I'll give you one example. There's something called nanodegrees. Some of you may have heard of it. Udacity runs it, nanodegrees, which means I'm a literature guy, but suddenly I have this passion towards what he was saying in a blockchain. And so conventional wisdom will tell you literature and blockchain, where's the connection, <laughs> right? So now I have an opportunity, and I think the onus of directing people, because I've seen this when I tell people about Coursera and edX, you know, I have this common challenge as an associate dean earlier of the undergrad programs. Second year, one of the challenges students will say, Prof, can I major in this and minor in this? And he's very confused, you know, he wants to know. Now the answer is not straightforward because it pertains to your passion, pertains to what you want to do. So when you tell them, listen, you don't need to major or minor, you do what you want to do in this. And then there are a number of free options available. There's edX, there's Coursera. And the guy is actually stumped. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know this Coursera. And this is a you know, smart, intelligent, 20-something uh, uh, character who has no idea. So I think more and more of this exposure to these specialized skills, which are available free of cost, somebody says, how do I improve my language skills? Just watch English movies, go to YouTube. There are hundreds of free resources available. Exactly. So I think it's that direction that we need to provide them. And it can be anything. Today, you have everything. YouTube is now equally strong as a search engine that provides almost all the intelligence here that you want. So I think the answer is direction. <laughs> Bryn, yeah. Bryn, you want to say something? I just want to add on the mic to, the, to this point. To give you a real example, I have a 17 year old son and I have a five year old son and I've seen both generations. And for example, if I see my five year son and the knowledge and the way that he talks and he interacts with the iPad, PlayStation and so on, I seriously wasn't there at 18 or 16. Why would I need to put him until 20 to graduate from university? It's a waste of resource. Trust me, we need to change. My, my iPad is broken today, Khalifa, so maybe I need to get your five-year-old son to fix it. But <laughs> just to, 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 to answer the, the point that came up, I, I probably need to reflect a bit more on the, you know, whether 18 years or so, you know, how, how much education is enough. But, um, I think what, all, what, it, what will change, what is changing already, is the nature of the interaction between education universities and students and employees. So I think it's no longer a binary thing where someone goes through the education system, they leave and then they never come back. I think it will become much more um, flexible, nuanced, um, uh, that people might leave, 10 years later they'll come back, they might do a degree, maybe they'll just come back and do a short course, three months, one month. I think it'll be much more flexible. It's that whole lifelong learning agenda. I just have to pay respect to Danish and his uh, respected school. I have the experience and the pleasure to work with your student. I invited them into a program that I created. It's called uh, 
knowledge rooms. It is, we just selected 10 of uh, DPS school students. They came on time for four hours. They were learning a new technique of learning, exactly like they chose the subject, they went to the internet, they really searched that internet subject, they proposed a report. From there, I take them to the rest of the rooms. Room number three will be, uh, they will write a song. R room number four, they will paint a painting. Five will be uh, modeling this one. And six, they will act it as a play. And seven, we will ca catch up what we learned from this one and recite it in our memory. Excellent performance. In four hours, they didn't want to leave. They enjoyed it and they had really, I have a video about this one. I can share it with you, Dennis. Just to pay that respect. Thank you. So much. Thank you. I think uh, uh, just as we spoke about, there are certain rules about the education system. Uh, which need to be broken. Uh, I won't say broken, but it is a very amorphous, fluid environment. So you need to, yeah, and, and it's important for allowing our students to explore their passions, their uh, creativity and curiosity. I mean, I, I'll give a personal example. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed about it, but I took an online course in digital marketing in mobile uh, application writing and photography and there were other people in the class it was a global online class with uh, you know audio only and uh, uh, through a, a dublin based company everyone was less than half my age in that class without exception um, and then we had a test uh, online test and the results came out i was top of the class so <laughs> Not, not in photography, but in digital marketing. Uh, I was top of the class. Mobile, I was somewhere in the middle. Photography, I was pretty bad. But in digital marketing... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, of course, you know, I got a round of applause from uh, everyone who was in the online class. And then I revealed my age and they were even more shocked. But they, everybody was curious, why are you going at your age to learn about digital marketing and mobile? Uh, because I want to. I just want to know. I mean, tomorrow if I'm interviewing somebody to hire, I need to know, you know, what kind of world do you live in? So I don't think learning is about, uh, you know, the structured industrial system that we have created. We have to sort of uh, loosen the knots and let people explore. And some of these platforms like uh, Udacity, uh, Udemy, and edX are doing a wonderful job. Uh, one more example, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the the founder of Udacity, he was a professor in Harvard in computer sciences. The first course that he launched, he had a capacity of I think only uh, 99 or 98 students in the class who could take the class in Harvard. He opened up his classroom to the world. He had, I mean the servers were crashing because there were thousands of students who wanted to take that class. And he made everyone go through the same test. The guys who learned in a personalized learning experience in the class and the guys who took the online class. 98 out of the 100 people, top 100 people who graduated from that course were online. Which means that how much of creativity, passion are our education systems denying? You know, the world of talented people is out there. We need to open ourselves. So with that, uh, thank you. Is there a question? Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, I think you touched on something really important. I was at a lecture the other day which was about the 100-year life. And I realized I spent a week thinking about this concept because I realized I had never thought about actually living to 100. I had probably max thought of living to the age of my parents, which was, I guess, a precedent of the age uh, the genes were living to. And uh, the lecture was about, have you actually thought of uh, how you're going to fill this 100 years? Currently, it's very much about education at the early stages of your life. Then you go work, and then you go retire. However, you've pointed out you're taking online courses now. A lot of people will have to rethink how they're going to live their life. You might have three careers uh, across your life, which might mean you could be studying languages when you're young, and then suddenly you go and study engineering at the age of 50. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, this is a brilliant summary, and I, I, I think we have 
eaten, almost eaten into our uh, uh, tea break, but I think we broke some rules here in this panel discussion. We, you know, it was no more, you know, uh, gray-haired guys on this side and people asking questions. It became a conversation. This is how we wanted it to be. And uh, thank you, everyone in the audience, and especially our panelists. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.